Hello everybody, Brian Kelson with you again, working as best he can to show you that the mid-axe catch cry of Romans through Philemon uh, is a dispensational lie. You know, we can find redemptive truths in all scripture, but the presumption that everything that Paul wrote is about us today and related to the mystery, the dispensation of the grace of God, as found in Ephesians and Colossians, is just a blanket of blindness. Let's start with a very popular mid-Acts passage, Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. He says in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You know what? Very strong words, aren't they? And Paul is defending the Galatians against the Judaizers who wanted circumcision and obedience to the law for salvation. Now the problem is that the emphasis on the fact that Paul received this from the Lord, not of man or not by man. Given by revelation, well in chapter 2 he went up to Jerusalem by revelation, didn't he? And of course in 1 Corinthians 12 um, he speaks about, though he speaks with the tongues of men and angels and the understands all mysteries. I mean 2 Corinthians 12, the visions and revelations. Um, you know friends, Paul received revelations and Paul received mysteries. It's just the fact that Paul in Galatians says that his gospel came through Christ Jesus does not mean that the gospel he received and was preaching in the Acts period is the dispensational truth out of Ephesians and Colossians. There's the mystery of Israel's blindness that Paul wrote about in Romans 11. There's the mystery kept secret since the world began in Romans 16. There's the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's the mystery of godliness in um, 1 Timothy 3, is it 16? There's the wisdom of God in a mystery in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. There are lots of mysteries found in the writings of Paul. It doesn't mean they're all the same. Paul must be rightly divided. And the right division of Paul explodes Romans through Philemon for the confusion that it is. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11.23, he received something by Christ, which was about the Passover meal. We've looked at that. And in 1 Corinthians 15.3, he said, I delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was... Um, and, died and was buried and raised again according to the scriptures. I didn't write it, I, I just quoted it roughly. But you know what I'm saying? He received that by revelation, by Christ teaching him, I believe, for 40 days in the wilderness. But the fact of the matter is, no matter how long it was, it was by Christ, but it was still according to the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 15, we looked at the bottom of the chapter, didn't we? 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. That's Paul in the Acts period preaching his gospel given by revelation mid-Acts and it's Isaiah. That's not the mystery hid in God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, he's quoting Hosea chapter 13, which says, I will be thy king. Isaiah 25 says, on this mountain. In Romans 15, this is fascinating, uh, I love the fact that the Apostle Paul speaks clearly about hope. And he says, is this Paul's gospel, by the way, mid-Acts, Romans 15, 4, given by revelation? Because if 1 Corinthians 15, according to the scriptures, is not enough, how about Romans 15, 4? For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Oh, this is Paul in Romans mid-Acts. Romans through Philemon doesn't work if the scriptures aforehand were written for our learning. And Paul goes on that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The hope of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 is Isaiah 25 and Hosea. In 1 Corinthians 15, we've got Adam and a garden and dominion. 
And here again, he's repeating himself. His gospel by revelation, the scriptures, i.e. the Old Testament ones, give forth the hope. Now, in verse 8, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God. So Christ's ministry had the inclusion of the Gentiles. Now, Paul's gospel comes down a little in verse 16, doesn't it? He says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. Well, at this point in Romans, it's full of Isaiah, just as it is in Isaiah at the bottom of 1 Corinthians 15. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Christ ministered that the Gentiles would be included. Paul's a ministry to those Gentiles. That's the context, mid-Acts. Romans 15 starts with the ministry of Christ and the inclusion of the Gentiles. And Paul is a ministry, a minister to those Gentiles that were included in the ministry of Christ. Now, he says in verse 18, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ had not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders, verse 19, Romans 15, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. This is Romans mid-Acts, and I sincerely want you to listen to what Paul is saying in his words here. I'll repeat it. So have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. This is Romans. How can Paul, in Romans, write that he did not want to build on anyone else's foundation if he's preaching the mystery of Ephesians which was given to him alone. In other words, Paul says he goes to parts where Christ hadn't been preached because he didn't want to build on somebody else's foundation. Oh, so somebody else had the mystery? The dispensation of the grace of God? Don't think so. Romans is Isaiah and Zion, just as the resurrection in Corinthians is Romans and Isaiah. Speaking of 1 Corinthians 15 and another man's foundation, I'm going to jump back to 1 Corinthians 15 for just a minute because I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now then, he goes on to who had seen Christ. He was seen of Cephas, of the twelve, five hundred brethren, James, and then all of the apostles. And last, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. But in verse 11, he says this, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Ah, right. So, Peter, James, the twelve, and the other five hundred brethren are named. If they were preaching, these Corinthians had heard some of them and believed and were saved. They were not saved exclusively by Paul's gospel. He says so in 1 Corinthians 15, 11. They believed whether it was Paul or the others who preached. I want to come back to Romans 15. Paul says in verse 20, we've just looked at it. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, 
Now we've looked at this before, but I'm trying to emphasize to my mid-ax viewers who stay longer than two minutes, <laughs> the as it is written occurs frequently in those groups of letters which are full of Old Testament prophecy and promise. As it is written, says Paul, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. Now I've looked at this before, and this is Isaiah 52. Oh, so he's quoting Isaiah in Corinthians, he's quoting Isaiah in Romans. There's no progression out of the Old Testament prophet and Paul, is there? Isaiah 52, 15. And it says, So shall he sprinkle many nations, that the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. That is Paul. Now, do you know, In I said he quoted this chapter twice in the Acts period. Actually, I think it's three times. If you come back to verse 11, it says, Isaiah 52, 11, Depart, depart. Go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. And Paul actually quoted this in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 7. So he's certainly got Isaiah 52 on his mind, hasn't he? And Isaiah 52, we know, is a, a very powerful passage about the servant who will justify many. One of Paul's great gospel themes is justification, isn't it? And it's all here in Isaiah. And Paul was given his gospel by revelation. And the gospel in the Acts period wasn't something that was hid in God. It was prophecy and promise. But it had to be given to Paul. And it was given to Paul by revelation. Now let me, let me repeat this. Simply because Paul received his gospel by revelation in Galatians and Corinthians does not mean it is the mystery and the dispensation of the grace of God as found in Ephesians and Colossians written after Israel nationally were put aside at Acts 28. But further up in Isaiah 52, we have verse 7, which says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation. Paul's message, right? Paul's gospel by revelation. That saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. This is quoted in Romans chapter 10. And I want to go to Romans 10 again. Because he's quoting Isaiah 52 in Romans 10. He hasn't forgotten Isaiah. He's quoting it in Romans 15, 52, the same chapter. In chapter 10, as you know, Paul has already quoted Moses regarding righteousness by faith out of Deuteronomy 30. But verse 11 says, For what the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, Romans 10, 11, shall not be ashamed. That's out of Isaiah 28. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. There's no difference as to salvation. There's no difference as to faith. But it's due first in Romans, isn't it? Verse 13, For whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Where's that from? Everyone who's been listening to my videos and reading my substract articles. <laughs> substract articles. That's out of Joel 2. And we're going to go and look at that in a minute. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom... In him of whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written from Isaiah 52, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you think that's Paul in the Acts period? Preaching the gospel of peace out of Isaiah 52, but given to him by revelation. Now, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13, is out of Joel chapter 2. I want to go there and look at Joel chapter 2. 
Joel chapter 2 is phenomenal and I'm going to read it from verse 20 to 27. I will remove far off from you the northern army. You need to read all of the chapter, the canker worm, but I want you to see the word repent. I want you to see the word trumpet in chapter 2. <laughs> the northern army. I will drive him into a land barren and desolate and with his face towards the east sea. Verse 21. I didn't finish that verse. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Oh, Paul's gospel out of Joel 22 is saying, like Isaiah and Hosea and the rest of the passages that Paul quotes from the Old Testament, prophecies about the restoration of the land. Do you know, I think there's a harmony between Paul's gospel given by Revelation and the question of the disciples in Acts 1.6, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Anyway, let me go on. Be not afraid, verse 22 of Joel 2, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Oh, Zion. How many times has Paul mentioned Zion in Romans? And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. Don't the Pentecostal screw this passage up. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. The beasts of the field. Uh, do not be afraid, says the Lord. Now, I want to go back to Romans again. And I want to look at Romans 15, because we spoke about the Lord being a minister of um, uh, the circumcision, and it's all about the hope, the things written beforehand, that includes Joel. And um, I want you to uh, just consider the parallel and the harmonies here. Now I say that Jesus Christ, verse 8 of Romans 15, was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God. And Paul is a minister of the Gentiles in the same chapter. And Paul has linked his ministry in Gentiles with a ministry of Christ. You can separate the two ministries, but the Gentile inclusion is tying the two men, Christ and Paul, together. Now, verse 12. All these verses that Paul is putting out to the Roman readers that the Gentiles are included according to prophecy includes Isaiah. Oh, we've already been to Isaiah and 1 Corinthians 15. Well, hang on a minute. Romans 15, 12. And again, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust or hope. Hope and trust, synonymous. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Believing what? Believing what Isaiah has written. And this is Paul's gospel by revelation. Isaiah 11. In Isaiah 11 verse 10. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to which shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Paul's gospel, including the gospel of hope, is from Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Let's look 4 to 9. But with righteousness shall this servant, full of the Spirit, judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked one, or the wicked. I think that has to do with two Thessalonians, but we haven't got time for that. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. Isn't it wonderful that the Old Testament talks about Paul's gospel and righteousness? And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Ah, Joel, fear not, you beasts of the field. Joel, quoted in Romans 10. Isaiah 11, quoted in Romans 15. Are we seeing a consistency here? And the leopard, Isaiah 11, 6, shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. 
and the cow and the bear shall feed together, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hull of the asp, and the wind child shall put his hand on the cockatrice stem. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And that goes back to Numbers 14 and Israel's failure at Kadesh Barnea. But we haven't got time for that. Friends, Two passages of scripture that Paul quotes in Romans come back to creation being at peace with itself. Okay? Oh, yes, I know. Being justified, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But this is animal harmony. I wonder if there's a link in these passages with Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. And Adam in the garden was given dominion and the wolf lay down with the lamb. No one come up to bite Adam. All oh, right. So when Christ restores um, Israel in Isaiah 51 to the garden of the Lord, then we're going to have these things in place. But Paul wouldn't have referred to that anywhere else in Romans, would he? Well, I'm going to leave you with a passage in Romans that I want you to seriously consider. It's a wonderful passage, and I'm going to go to Romans chapter 8. Isn't it wonderful to start? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I wonder in the Acts period if people were dying because they were carnally minded. I don't know, 1 Corinthians 11 comes to mind, James 5 comes to mind, but that's for you to consider. <clears throat> now, verse 10. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Oh, what's the resurrection in Romans 8, do you think? Do you think the resurrection in Romans 8 is the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 with Isaiah in it? And Isaiah speaks about the wolf and the lamb and the lion and the kid and the vipers, Dan? Do you think the resurrection out of, of, of Isaiah is tied to the gospel out of Joel that Paul quotes in Romans 10, where fear not you beasts of the field? And Adam in Corinthians? Verse 18 of Romans 8, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What glory? It's not heavenly places in Romans. For the earnest expectation, verse 19, of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Oh, the expectation of the creature and sons of God. Well, creature and sons of God are not the same, are they? Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Oh, the entire creation. Would that include the wolf and the bear and the lion and the viper? And not only they, but ourselves also, which had the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. It wouldn't it be interesting if Romans 8, Paul is writing about creation, waiting for the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Wouldn't that be consistent with Romans 15 and Isaiah 52, Romans um, 10, Isaiah 52, Romans 10, Joel chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 15, and Isaiah 25, 28. It, this is Paul's mind. This is the gospel he received by revelation in the Acts period. Not by man, not of man, but by Christ alone. But it's all Old Testament prophecy and promise. It even has to do with the animals. I don't think the wolf and the lamb are in heavenly places. I don't think all the 
promise of fat things on the vines and the leaves and wine and meat, which are in those Isaiah and Joel passages, has to do with heavenly places. And I know what? When the Lord did that Passover feast, he said, I'm not going to drink wine again until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. Oh, so wine is in the kingdom of God and Paul uses prophecies that speak about it. Oh my goodness. Aren't all these things tied together? Paul in the Acts period is preaching the restored kingdom to Israel at a prophecy and promise. Romans through Philemon, stop it. It's a dispensational nightmare for people trying to understand the New Testament. Search and see and may the Lord be honored and blessed in all our searching.